Welcome to tonight's Farm Advisory Service webinar. Um, tonight we're going to be discussing funding your dream for new entrants. And I'm Laura Henderson, an uh, agricultural consultant with SEC Consulting based in Elgin, and I'll be chairing tonight. And I'm joined by our two guest speakers, Graham McNaughton, who is Director of Land of the State and Agriculture for Scotland at Barclays Bank. And he's a chartered banker with many years of experience. And our second speaker is Jane Mitchell, who's a director of Johnston Carmichael Chartered Accountants and Business Advisors, and she's a chartered accountant. And as well as that, she's a non-executive director of AM and a member of various committees on boards. So we hope to run for about an hour. And in that time, Jane and Graham will take us through where to find higher purchase and livestock finance, the terms and conditions, hidden costs, and do a bit of jargon and myth busting. Oh. Right. Good, excellent. Okay, thanks very much, Laura. So, um, evening, everyone. You might have noticed um, that I'm not Oliver McIntyre, who was on the original um, uh, email that came out. Oliver's taken a, a little break with his family. He's asked me to step in this evening. So. Um, <coughs> So, so I'm Graham McNaughton, as Laura said. I lead Barclays Agricultural Business in Scotland. I've been banking for almost 38 years. Last 10 of those uh, have been spent in the agricultural sector. And I've got clients throughout Scotland and spread across all of the key agricultural sectors. Um, talk tonight's maybe not quite what you've been expecting. Um, I've been asked to talk about, or all of us asked me to talk about uh, how banks assess lending proposals in the agricultural sector. So here goes. I uh, hope you find it interesting. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Laura? So before I start, just a wee bit of background um, on Barclays and our support for UK agriculture, or it could just be a little sales pitch, maybe. Uh, Barclays has over 327 years of banking experience. We concluded our first agricultural deal in 1744 over 270 years ago, and we've been supporting the sector ever since through an extensive team of agricultural managers across the UK and Scotland. Um, next slide, please, Laura. Good. Um, so agriculture is currently, as you all know, going through a period of massive change with the subsidy reg regime changing to a more environmentally based payment approach. Focus is now turning to sustainability, carbon and climate change, labour and technology, to name but a few, with public opinion on farming also gathering momentum. So just to some of these changes and to ensure that farms remain competitive and become more sustainable, farmers are having to reassess their operating model. This may mean having to diversify and innovate, and this will require investment, which in turn needs cash to fund the investment. Firstly, to remain competitive and encourage all business owners to review their cost bases and seek out efficiencies that can be made. Usually there isn't too much negotiating in the price you receive, so it's essential that your cost base is as lean as it can be. Secondly, businesses must continue to diversify to ensure that they have a mix of income streams and aren't solely reliant on any one source of revenue. Finally, I'd encourage regular and good quality forecasting and analysis of cash flows this will ensure that you're on top of any variances and can take action quickly if required. In my view, this is simply part of a strong business governance and risk management regime that should be embedded as business as usual. I'm sure that Jane and her colleagues at Johnson Carmichael would be delighted to help here. Next slide, please, Laura. So on the subject of cash and investment, this brings us nicely on to lending money, which is, uh, I think, what we, we're all here to find a little bit out about tonight. I wanted to highlight the concept of Compare. Um, us banks love acronyms, and, and this is one of them. This one uh, is an acronym for how banks assess an application for a business loan or, or other types of funding. As you can see from the slide, this stands for character, ability, means, purpose, amount, repayment, and insurance. Now, most of this is fairly obvious, I'm sure, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is that insurance or security, as it's more commonly referred to, is the last, albeit still very important, aspect that we consider. Hence, the reference to insurance rather than security. It's also worth noting that it comes after repayment. And yes, we do expect to get repaid at some point. 
Simply put, we need to fully understand what the loan is for, who we, who will, who we will be lending to, how do we get repaid, and what happens if the project doesn't go according to plan? What is the plan B? Have the next slide, please, Zellora. So let's look at purpose and amount. I'll come back to character, ability, and management later. Firstly, what's the funding to be used for? Are the funds to be used for working capital or capital expenditure? Typically, any day-to-day -day or short-term funding would be classed as working capital. Some examples of this would be finishing stock, seed and fertilizer, variable and day-to-day -day running costs of the farm. All of these would typically be short-term funding requirements. These could be financed through a number of routes, such as bank overdraft or profits or cash, built up from previous trading cycles, both of which are flexible and fluctuate year on year. Overdrafts are very common within agriculture and are typically put in place to cover normal trading expenditure, pending receipt of trading income, with an expectation, certainly from the bank side, that the overdraft would swing regularly between debit and credit. Just to be aware, however, that overdrafts are typically reviewed annually and are repayable on demand at any time, so should only be used for funding short-term expenditure rather than higher value capital expenditure items. For any larger capital purchases, such as machinery, land, infrastructure and breeding stock, there are also a number of options for funding. These could include retained profits or cash built up in the business over previous years, term loans or higher purchase and asset finance. All of these options would usually be on a more structured basis linked to the life cycle of the assets being acquired. I'd strongly advise that before you commit to a significant investment in associated funding, that you take advice from your accountant to ensure that it's structured appropriately. appropriately, appropriately. My teeth back in. Your accountant can also help prepare a business plan and cash flow forecast that the bank would acquire when considering a funding request. On to the next slide, please, Laura. So moving on to repayment and insurance. As I mentioned on the Compari slide, we do expect to get repaid and the source of repayment would usually be from profits generated by the business. Alternatively, repayment could come from sale of assets or from family members or a combination of those. When banks agree to provide funding, they usually look for a plan B to be in place that could be implemented should the business run into difficulties and not be able to repay the loan. In addition to plan B, the bank will usually require security for any facilities provided. Security would ordinarily comprise a fixed charge over the farm, with any facility provided equating to a percentage of the value of the farm held as security, for example, 70% loan to value. This means that the loan should be no more than 70% of the value of the farm. If the business is a limited company, then we'd also take a floating charge of security, which would provide a floating charge over machinery, livestock and debtors, although this would usually be in addition to a charge over the farm. Next slide, please, Laura. So coming back to character, ability and management, which are arguably the most important aspects of comparing when assessing loan applications. Whilst it isn't an exact science, this slide might help demonstrate how banks assess clients and their approach to running businesses. If we start at the top left and work anti-clockwise, we see the first category as those clients who are very hands-on and perhaps see higher commodity prices as a way to improve profitability and have limited engagement with the supply chain. These clients are survivors and they're maybe least likely to change and adopt new farming practices. Moving now to the bottom left, we have the doers. These clients are very similar to the survivors but see the answer to increased profitability as working harder. Doers will rely on suppliers for advice and will have some limited engagement with buyers. In the bottom right, we have the managers who have an evolving focus and actively seek out professional advice as well as engaging with buyers. Managers tend to see increasing, increasing efficiency as a solution to improving profitability. Finally, in the top right, we have the entrepreneurs and leaders. These clients have a laser focus on leadership and innovation and will have a deep engagement with the supply chain. Typically, entrepreneurs and leaders will recognize value creation for customers as solutions to improve profits. So why is this important? I'd like to stress the importance of focusing on profitability. 
think margin, not yields. As good yield, it doesn't always equal margin. Please ensure you know what your cost of production actually is, ensuring that any cost of borrowing is included. Remember that you can't influence the price you sell at, but you can influence your cost of production. If you think back to the previous slides on repayment, the common theme has been profits as a source of loan repayment. An old boss of mine used to say, volume for vanity and profit for sanity. And very true. Next slide, please, uh, Laura. There we go. So just to finish, I'd like to leave you with the circles of influence. This hopefully highlights what I outlined in my earlier slides about focusing time and energy on those issues that we can control and not issues that we can't. Whilst this will require a mindset change for some of us, it will result in a positive outcome and allow us to devote more of our time and energy on strategic matters. And next slide, please, Laura. So I hope you found this interesting. It's not necessarily um, the, the talk on asset finance and stock funding that you might have been expecting, but hopefully it's been of interest. Uh, do feel free to ask me some questions. I think we're saving those till the end. And uh, I'll now hand back to uh, Laura to introduce Jane to you. Thank you all very much for listening. I'll hand over to you now, Jane. That's great, Laura. Thank you very much. Okay, so Graham's done the technical sort of chat at the beginning. This is a bit sort of different. So all of you will be thinking about what you want to fund. Good to see that some of you want to fund short-term assets. Some of you want to fund long-term assets. It's only one person out of the poll wasn't sure what they wanted to fund yet. So hopefully this helps your thinking in that. So what I'm going to cover just in a bit more detail, Graham spoke about purposes of, of borrowing and amounts. I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail. I've got five slides that I'm going to go through. So those of you who are waiting for me to finish, you know by the time I come to slide five, that will be finished. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about types of assets for a start. Graham covered that in a little bit of detail. I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, then we'll talk about types of funding to match against the assets that you're thinking of funding. A bit more about matching the actual assets to the funding that you've got. Good to get that right, whether you've got a current business at the moment where your funding might not be set up properly or whether you're just about starting in business and good to see we've got a good mix of people on the call. I am an accountant, so we can't get away from the fact that I will talk about tax implications, but I'll try and make it sound quite exciting as opposed to the normal boring accounting chat. And then I've got a slide just with some contacts on them at the end. So those of you that don't have a pen and paper, now's the time to rush away and get that. Okay, slides are still moving on, Laura. No, done good. Okay. So really important when you're thinking about the types of asset that you want to fund, whether they're long-term assets or short-term assets. And a lot of Scottish agriculture is actually funded on overdraft. You know, it's a traditional type of funding that most businesses in agriculture just have always been funded that way. Yeah buy a bit of equipment, it goes on to your overdraft. Um, you put up a new shed, it tends to end up on your overdraft. But banks these days are more inclined to try and get you to match the type of asset with long or short term funding. So I've tried to cover here the things that most of you will be looking to fund um, in your farm or rural business. Obviously, the biggest thing that most of you will ever consider doing is a farm purchase. Next down on the list, you know, is building construction. So building construction can be anything from a steel portal frame building to an all singing, all dancing, um, single purpose, intensive livestock sort of shed, whether that's for pigs or poultry. Next to that, you know, your next biggest purchase is planting equipment and planting equipment these days, you know, I don't have to tell you on the call, but, um, you know, you buy a combine these days and you buy a new one, you don't have much change out of 200,000. Um, so these are, these are big purchases these days and it's good to get the funding right. 
Livestock, quite a few of you on the call might be thinking of funding livestock, whether that be cattle, sheep, pigs, chickens, any sort of livestock. And all funding institutions have a large range of people who approach them for various types of livestock. Um, and, you know, sometimes obscure livestock as well, not just your normal sort of species that you see. And crop inputs. Quite often people don't really think about funding their crop inputs, but you'll know yourself by the time you've bought your seed, your fertilizer, you've bought your spray. If you're farming significant acres, it soon those costs soon add up. And it's always a good idea to think about what those inputs are going to add up to in a year. So that covers most of the assets that you'd be thinking of funding. Anybody who's got any additional assets that they're thinking about funding that I haven't covered here and you've got a question about it, just put that into the chat box and Laura can let me know about that later. So what are the types of funding? You know, we've got Graham on the call here. He works for a bank. Quite often people will automatically think about going to a bank for funding. Um, but believe it or not, the types of funding, um, the most commonly sort of used funding when people are in business is either using their own money first or getting money from a family member to help them with a new enterprise or maybe to start uh, a completely new farming business. Um, there's lots of money tied up in agriculture just now. There are a lot of families that are very asset rich. Um, there's a lot of people sitting with quite significant funds and you would be surprised how many people rely on family members to fund their business. Next in line would be going to your bank um, and after that specialist funders. So when we talk about specialist sort of funding, you know, a bank will fund things like higher purchase for equipment and a bank will fund things like livestock if you want to buy livestock. But there are specialist funders out there that we'll speak about later that will specifically do plant and machinery finance or livestock finance. The really important thing in anything you do when you borrow money is making sure that your business can actually afford to service and repay the additional debt. Um, you know, when, when farm funding was sitting in overdraft, there wasn't really a a desire, I suppose, in, in those days for either customers or the bank to have that debt repaid. But a lot of businesses haven't moved on because they've always sat with funding going overdraft. And I would suggest, as this is, you know, sort of new entrance here, you know, set yourself targets as to how quickly you want to repay your debt. Because in my experience, you know, the more progressive people in life are people who've repaid their debt and they've been able to move on um, and buy another farm, buy more equipment, maybe lease a bit of extra sort of land because they've set themselves pretty good targets to repay the debt that they've got. Interest rates are practically insignificant at the moment. Now's a good time to borrow money. Um, you know, when Graham and I were younger, you know, there were, there were years when people were paying interest at 15%. Um, and when you think of where, where interest rates are at the moment, money is very cheap. So to expand, I would suggest now is the time to borrow money, but just always make sure that you can service, which is meeting the loan payments and make the repayments towards the debt. So matching the funding to the asset, this is this is really important. Um, and knowing right at the outset whether the asset you're buying is a long-term or a short-term asset. So land is obviously a long-term asset. There's not many people in agriculture buy a farm and decide to sell it two years later, unless it goes drastically wrong. Um, but land, most financial institutions will look at you know, 20 to 25 years, some financial institutions even longer to repay a commitment such as a land purchase. 
if you can repay it quicker, you know, try and get some sort of flexible element to the loan that you take out um, so that if you do have additional cash, you can put that towards the loan. If you've maybe had a bad sort of season, you know, the loan is flexible enough that, you know, after making payments for two or three years, you've got the option of going to the bank and maybe saying, look, things are not working out as I expected. Could I maybe have some sort of holiday from repaying the loan this year? A few lenders in the market will lend interest only. Um, but again, going back to what I said earlier, just consider what your long term goal is on, on the farm. And if you're not, if you're going to go interest only on a land purchase, bear in mind that it's probably then going to be more difficult if you want to expand later, if you've not actually repaid any of that debt on that farm purchase where you've gone interest only. Buildings, I would consider a medium term asset. So buildings uh, don't last forever. Um, believe it or not. So I would suggest that if you take a loan out for any sort of building, that you try and take that over 10 years. Um, a lot of buildings you'll put up for a few tens of thousands of pounds. And a lot of people in the past have put those onto their overdraft. I would suggest that even if the building's costing £40,000, you try and take that out onto some sort of loan structure so that you know that, you know, the borrowings you've got are specifically attributed to that asset. Farm machinery is relatively short term. Um, so if you're buying new farm machinery, you can take out a loan over probably five years. If you're buying secondhand machinery, the maximum that you really want to take that machinery over is probably three years. Um, your bank is the first person that I would suggest that you go to for either a loan or a higher purchase agreement. Most banks have a higher purchased element to their business uh, where those people who are in the higher purchase department know exactly how to match the lending to the asset that you're buying. If it's higher purchase, think about, you know, as in any loan, you know, when is most of your income coming into the business? So if you're an arable farmer and you're basically selling all your machinery at harvest, try not to have 12 months of payments on a combine. Try and have that either once a year when harvest money is coming in or twice a year when harvest money is coming in and your subsidy payments coming in. Try and match your income basically to any payments that you've got either on land buildings or farm machinery. Don't end up having months where you're short in cash flow um, just because the higher purchase company has said, well, you know, we'll only do like a 12 month sort of monthly payment sort of structure over three years. Try and speak to them about where your income is coming from and which months that's coming into your cash flow. Livestock, again, think about whether they're breeding livestock or whether you're just buying livestock to trade over sort of 12 to 18 months. Your breeding stock. You know, you could probably have them over three years if it's cattle or if it's sheep. Um, things like pigs, chickens, if you're buying cattle to fatten at the mart, try and have that funding just short term over a year. Um, a lot of the marts offer livestock finance because it's generally you know, relatively unsecured finance. Again, it can sometimes be slightly more expensive than going to your, your bank. So I know I'm a director of AM and I should probably be saying you should always go to the mark for your finance, but always speak to your bank first because they will tend to offer you the cheapest funding that's available. And your crop inputs that I spoke about earlier, they're seasonal. Um, short term funding for a year, there's no reason why that can't be an overdraft. But if you're growing fruit, you know, where you've got a lot of these, um, you know, raspberry cane, strawberry plants, blueberries, you know, where the plants will last four, five, maybe six years, um, think about trying to put them on a longer term loan if you don't have the funding just to fund them up front. 
So that's a really important bit about matching funding to the asset. And what I would say, there's a lot of established businesses on the call tonight. Um, I would suggest if your funding that you've got for your business at the moment doesn't follow that pattern that's on that slide, this is a good opportunity for you to have a look at what funding you've got at the moment and maybe having a word with the bank just to see if it's sitting in the right boxes. Just because the funding is there at the moment, it doesn't mean to say that the bank will not look um, to rejig your funding and it maybe matches better with your cash flow. So I was glad to see that Graham earlier said, you know, speak to your accountant to always take advice on any sort of major purchase that you're you're doing. Um, have a word with your bank, also have a word with your accountant just to make sure that you're not missing any sort of tax relief. Um, so, you know, land, if you're buying land, there's probably not a good time or not a bad time to buy land. It's it's not critical what, what day of the month or what month of the year that you tend to buy land. You'll not get tax relief on the whole purchase of the farm but you will get tax relief on any loan interest that you pay for the purchase of a farm. There's also really important sort of capital tax reliefs as well um, that are still in place for people who are farming, business property relief, um, agricultural property relief. They're really important capital tax reliefs that if you do decide to sell when you want to retire, or the farms being passed over to the next generation, there's there's really good uh, tax reliefs at the moment. That's why so many farmers tend to farm until their very last sort of few years. Buildings, the tax allowances are not so exciting at the moment. Um, you get 3% per annum basically on any purchase price of any structures or buildings that you're putting up. Um, whereas farm machinery at the moment, you get full tax relief on the cost of any new assets that you buy and you'll get tax relief basically on the higher purchase interest or the loan interest that you pay on the machinery. If you're putting up buildings and they've got an element of plant and equipment in them, so movable gates, um, movable partitions, things like that. When you get your building done, make sure that whoever's building the building separates out what's actually building and what can be claimed as plant and machinery costs. Um, because obviously there's a big difference there in the tax relief that you get. Um, so don't just be satisfied with the fact that you get one invoice building a shed and that's it um, because you'll not, your accountant won't know the split between what's plant and equipment sort of type stuff where you can get full tax relief and what's actually the building building bits where you only get 3%. Livestock, um, you know, if, if you've got a herd, what I would suggest if you've got breeding livestock, sheep, cattle, pigs, try and get yourself on the herd basis. Speak to your accountant about getting the business on the herd basis. The herd basis is a historical um, tax relief that basically if you retire from farming, you get the whole of the value of that herd with, you know, when you sell it, not having to pay any tax on it. That's a really valuable um, tax relief to have. And I'm always surprised when we take over sort of businesses that have herds um, or flocks um, that they're not on the herd basis. So just if there's one thing you take away from tonight, if you've got breeding lives, so just check with your accountant that your business is definitely on the herd basis. Any lending that you take for livestock, again, you'll get tax relief on the interest on the loan or any lending that you've got. And crop inputs, um, again, if you take, take that just an overdraft, you get full tax relief on the interest that you pay on your overdraft. But any major um, asset purchase that you're looking to do always make sure that you speak to your accountant to make sure it falls into the right tax year to make sure that there's no changes to the allowances because you know tax changes quite a lot and just because um, you know 
you spoke to the farmer next door and he got full tax relief on buying his combine last week. Just check with your accountant that if you're buying something in a few months from now, that the tax relief is still there. The exchequer is looking to get a lot of tax back to cover um, everything that's happened to the country and the, you know, the, the grants that everybody's got that their businesses can carry on. So just because what's there at the moment is there at the moment may not be there going forward. This is my last slide. So it's really important, you know, to start with who you know when you're looking to borrow money. So I spoke about, you know, most businesses either, you know, go to their own sort of cash reserves for a start to fund their business or they'll go to a family member. So I always say to people, you know, if you've got a sum of money yourself that you've saved up, and you go to a bank or a lender to fund your project, banks are very good at finding out from you just what your asset base is before they'll lend you any money. And if you're not prepared to put some of your own money into a project, a bank or a lender is probably unwilling to, to fund your project if you're not prepared to put some of the money you've got at risk as well. Be really kind to all your relatives. So everybody always has a little bit of a laugh when I say this, but um, you know, you never know when one of your relatives, you know, might want to help you out. And if you've fallen out with all your relatives and you've got a really, you know, wealthy uh, auntie. Um, if you fall out with her, she's unlikely to help you in your business. Whereas if you're friends with all your aunties and they've got lots of money, they might be prepared to help your business. If it's a family loan that you've got, I would um, always encourage you to speak to your solicitor just about getting a simple loan agreement drawn up. Um, you know, banks will send you out a loan agreement when they're lending you money. And I know it kind of sounds, well, if, if, you know, my auntie's given me some money, she's probably not going to want it back. You don't know that that's, that's not the case. So a simple loan agreement, just so that everybody knows whether this money is a gift, you know, for lifetime or whether there's certain triggers when that family member could ask for the money back. Also, what the interest rate's going to be on um, you know, a family loan. Uh, lots of people have gone into family loans not expecting to pay any interest. And um, sort of 12 months down the line, there's a demand from that relative to say that they want a bit of interest on the money. I know banks aren't offering a whole lot of interest at the moment. Um, so they might find it quite a good way of getting a little bit of income if they lend your business money. So just be absolutely clear if it's family money, what the expectations are for repayment. Your bank, um, you know, if you know your bank manager, and a lot of people don't know their bank managers just now, um, you know, everybody's got a phone. Graham's team of people that he's got, he's got people on the ground, but he's also got people who are in a centre who deal with lots of agricultural businesses. Get to know that person even by phone. Um, and the better the relationship you have with that person, the more chance you have of, you know, being able to borrow money from them. Banks do long term funding. They also do short term funding. So I've put a link there just to show you how to go onto the Internet and find out what sort of lending you can get from Barclays. Uh, Barclays also have asset finance, um, a link on their website just for borrowing money for asset finance for plant and machinery purchases. And you ex would expect me to have the Aberdeen and Northern Marts link there just for borrowing money for livestock purchases. Um, so yeah, lots of useful information there for anybody who wants to borrow money. And that's my last slide, Laura. So we can move to questions. Yes, thank you very much for those presentations. Um, it's quite clear that your extensive experience of agricultural finance has um, given us lots of tips there on higher purchase. And so type away your question. But we'll just start with this one. Um, We'll go to both of you, I think. We'll start with you, Graham, on this one. But Jane, you can pop in your bit 
Um, but Jane, in your presentation, you mentioned taking a higher purchase agreement for no longer than five years for a piece of second-hand machinery. But if I had bought a second-hand say, tractor on a higher purchase agreement for three years, and after the first year, it started breaking down all the time and the repairs were getting expensive, can I leave that agreement early and what impact will it have on the repayment and tax? Right, so yes, you know, I spoke about earlier, if you've got a history with your bank and things start going wrong, you can speak to your bank just to get an agreement sort of rearranged and it's exactly the same on a higher purchase agreement. So if you have bought a duff tractor and these things do happen um, and it doesn't look like, you know, that tractor is going to work for you, there's nothing to stop you selling on that tractor and buying a new one. You just stop the agreement um, and start a new agreement on whatever you sort of buy as a replacement. Make sure that when you sign these agreements so that there's not any early sort of um, repayment clauses for any of these agreements. Higher purchase is generally quite straightforward and, you know, there doesn't tend to be the, the early repayment charges on these sorts of agreements as there are on things like fixed rate bank loans or anything like that. But just make sure that if you're going into something, you know exactly what you're signing up to. Um, but yeah, lots of people, you see it a lot in, I suppose, with cars, you know, a farmer buys a Range Rover and he keeps it for a couple of years, but he's on, it's a brand new Range Rover, so he's taken the agreement over five years and he wants the latest Range Rover two years sort of down the track. So he stops that agreement or goes back to the same garage and they just reconstitute the, agree the, the new agreement on the new car. It's not uncommon for that to happen. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. If Graham, is you anything to add there? No, I think Jane covered it uh, pretty nicely there. I'd, I'd echo the point around um, check for early termination clauses and the likes, uh, but, but no, nothing more to add. Good. And we've got a question for, I think we'll put it to you, Graham. How important is the training history for new entrants if you just don't have the same history as an established business? Yeah. So, so, yeah, no, very, very good question. I mean, I guess it's it's around the, the experience of the individual. So we would we'd expect to see, um, you know, if we take a farm purchase, for example, we don't expect to see the applicant having worked in the sector for quite some time to build up the skills and the experience. Um, and I guess it's back to Jane's point as well. And, you know, what contribution um, is the individual um, or the or the business going to make towards the purchase? Um, but it, you know, it's 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 around the, I guess the character capability. Um, on my slide, you know, what 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 are they what are they good at? I so say we wouldn't want to see somebody coming into the sector that's never done it before. You know, we'd obviously you know, unless they're bringing in a farm manager, for example. But uh, I think it's more around the, um, the 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 pedigree and the character and the track record of the individuals. Clearly, if they're buying an established business, you could then. You know, you, you could then look at the um, the trading history of that business. Obviously, bearing in mind it would be a, a, a new um, owner that would be running that. But that, you know, I think that's that's important as well. So, so it's important, but it's not the um, it's not the be all and end all. I think it's it's around the character and the uh, the capability of the of, of the individual or individuals that are coming in. And you know, a lot of um, you know, I know the SR the SEC. Um, are looking at how to encourage more new entrants into the sector, and it's uh, it's um, it, it, it's key that we, we as banks recognise that not everybody's going to have a trading track record. Yeah, thank you for that, Graham. And this one might go to you, Jane. Is a bank loan or higher purchase finance looked at differently on the balance sheet, and how would it affect the potential to borrow additional funds should it be required? Just writing that down because I've got a really bad memory. <laughs> so yeah, uh, on the balance sheet, um, so 
when you get your accounts from your accountant, you've got your profit and loss account, which is the history of your year's sort of trading. And your balance sheet is at the one date that your year end is. And your balance sheet sits with assets at the top and liabilities at the bottom. So your bank loans and higher purchase sit as liabilities at the bottom part of your balance sheet. Depending on whether you've taken out your, your funding correctly, where you've got short term and long term sort of funding, um, if you've bought a farm and bought, for example, a combine and a tractor, that bank loan for the farm will be split. There'll be a certain amount of the payments are due within one year and a certain amount of the payments that are due after one year and your liabilities are split in the balance sheet in that sort of way. Higher purchase is exactly the same thing. So you buy something and there's like a short term element of that higher purchase agreement and then there's long term. So the banks will assess, you know, can this business afford to service and repay the debt that's sitting there based on what funding is due to be paid year on year? And there's, there's no real difference in the tax or sort of treatment of those loans, whether they're long term or short term. So no tax relief on your bank loan for your purchase of the farm, other than the interest that you pay on that loan. Uh, your higher purchase, as we said earlier, if you buy a bit of equipment at the moment, you're getting 100% tax relief in that first year that you buy that asset. So if you buy a tractor for 50,000, you will be getting tax relief against your profits for the whole 50,000 on that tractor. Um, where it sits in the balance sheet, whether it's you know a little bit short term and mostly long term has no real effect on the tax relief. Um, I was also going to add just, you know, Graham's sort of point earlier just about the, you know, trading sort of history for new entrants. Um, I always say to people, you know, even if you've worked, you know, as a student, you know, so you've been to SRUC and you've done like your three years there, if you've had like a summer job and you've managed to save a little bit of money every year that you've worked in your summers and you've maybe got a part time sort of job that counts a lot as to how banks consider you if you if you go to the bank and say well I had a great life as a student and I spent all my money on wine women and song that's unlikely to go down very well so even if you've saved you know a couple of thousand a year five thousand a year those things count a lot when you're approaching someone for funding good thank you and we'll go to graham for the next question um can you explain the difference between contract hire and hire purchase and maybe give some examples of when one would be better than the other? Um, I've got to say that's not my area of expertise, I'm afraid, Laura. It's, uh, uh, we tend to, our asset finance colleagues um, deal with that. I, mean, I, I, I don't think there's a huge difference. Maybe Jane might uh, know a little bit more about how they work than me. So apologies, I'm going to have to duck that one, I'm afraid. Okay. Yeah, just um, so contract hire tends to be a bit like leasing equipment so your your sort of whole payments that you pay for your hiring of your tractor in that sort of 12 months all gets written off against your profit um it's your higher purchase you get your capital allowances so at the moment because you get full tax relief on the purchase of your fifty thousand pound tractor at the moment um it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. You know, your capital allowances on plant and equipment used to be just 25% of that asset every year. Um, so yeah, contract hire, you know, in my sort of view, if you're doing contract hire and you're working your machinery quite hard, contract hire is quite a good way to sort of get a newer piece of equipment more often than you would maybe get if you were buying a bit of equipment. Um, so I noticed my brother is on the call, so he will he will 
know what we do at home, which is we contract hire most of our equipment so that we don't have very big expenses um, having to repair stuff. That example that we spoke about earlier, where your tractor breaks down after two years because you've bought a second hand one, that's the last thing you really want to happen. And when I think about sets of accounts that I do at Johnson Carmichael, you know, the, the thing that sways people's profitability if it's not the weather is a bit of equipment breaking down um, because that's just what happens to equipment. So try try and buy the best that you can afford. Um, but yeah, contract hire, it's, it's becoming more common on farms these days. It's a good option for people if they don't want to be hit with big repairs. The only thing I might add is uh, we've seen quite a lot of clients that uh, sometimes don't take the full sort of service and warranty package when they buy new. So that's certainly uh, something that would be a top tip if your dealership is uh, is looking to uh, give you a servicing and uh, sort of upgrade package. You'll look very, very closely at that because the change is the last thing you want is your combine breaking down right in the middle of harvest. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's there for a reason. Thank you. And maybe then, Grim, you could get this one. Um, when you're forecasting your business performance, where should you get your figures from? So should it be based on future land prices? Because we also have had phenomenal trade um, for livestock this year. We're not guaranteed that that will sustain for the remainder of this year or even into next year. So where do you get your figures from? A really good question. I think um, first I'd say you'll speak to your accountant in terms of pulling together the uh, the, the 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 forecasts and budgets that, that banks and other funders would um, would like to see. I'm sure Jane can could help with that. Um, I mean, you, you probably you probably want to be looking at a sort of a base price, and you take an average of twelve months. Don't go straight in with the best price that there's ever been for. Uh, for sheep at the mart because you know it's only going to go one way <laughs> and if your forecasts are based on the very very top price and you don't attain that the top price then the first thing that's going to happen is you're not going to meet the forecast and your your banks will not be very happy so i'd probably take a you know take an average price um over the last you know, sort of 12 to 18 months unless there's particular circumstances and um, if you take pigs for example you know, historically they hadn't been great and pig, pig prices had moved up quite considerably. So there's an argument that you would use a, that, you know, a slightly better price. Also, I, I appreciate there's been a bit of turmoil in the market. Um, and then it's just uh, make sure that you look at your, your complete um, cost of production as well, include funding costs in there, um, and then look at sensitizing them. So once you've arrived at your, you know, your, your average price or your, your base price, if you like, for the, uh, you know, for your for all of your costs and, and, and your output, then sensitize it. Well, what happens if the price drops by you know 10%, 15%, or 20%? Equally, what happens if the, the price goes up by 10 or 15%? Um, and, and make sure that you're comfortable that if you're you know you, you pick a, a downside and that happens that, that actually you can sleep at night. And um, banks will typically run, you know, they, they, they'll run their own their own sensitivities, and that's typically around what happens if interest rates rise? But equally, if you've got a, I don't know, if you've got a, a big dairy herd, for example, what what happens if uh, milk price drops by you know a penny a litre? You know, what happens if the strawberry price uh, drops out of the market? You need to be looking at uh, uh, all of those things as well. But in terms of the, the original question, where should you get your prices from? Your Farmers Weekly is probably as good a good a spot as any. You could go and speak to your friendly um, uh, Mart director. I'm sure there'll be some some average prices that they can help you with there on the, from on a livestock front, but uh, make sure it's based on reality and it's not uh, you know, a, a sort of flash in the pan price would be my, my advice. Yeah, and I would just add as well, I think I've got here, hopefully you can see it. Um, the Farm Management Handbook um, produced by the Farm Advisory Service has got cost in for just about every kind of enterprise you can imagine. Um, it's updated annually and you can get hard copies, but um, it is free on the website. So just have a wee search for that. Um, and I think kind of the next question is about, along the theme of kind of the turmoil in the industry. And I think I'll put it to Jane. Um, so if you're buying cheaper cattle um, through March finance, 
what happens if you buy them at the phenomenally high prices we've had just now and then the market crashes? Who's responsible for the loss and does that impact on the interest payable? That's always a bit of a scary question. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, uh, when you take livestock out on mark financers, there's, there's always like a deposit that you have to pay. And that is meant to cover, I suppose, the fluctuations in cattle prices. Gone are the days for any sort of finance when you can kind of borrow 100 percent finance on anything. Um, that's really changed dramatically since 2008 when the financial crisis happened. Um, so, yeah, if you're going for finance, uh, bear in mind that there will always be an element of deposit that you have to pay unless you have a very strong business there already. Um, and it kind of goes back to the previous question, you know, when you're thinking about budgeting, um, you know, a lot of businesses on the call are established businesses. Graham and I have seen lots of projections where there's a, a loss-making business and suddenly they want to borrow more money and the projections show that they're going to be making a phenomenal profit. Um, I have a phrase that I use a lot, leopards and spots. So if you've got a business, Graham's laughing, he obviously uses that phrase as well. Um, but yeah, go on what, what you sort of know. Um, there's a few new businesses on, on the call as well. So don't go into something thinking that, you know, if this all goes wrong, someone else is gonna, gonna end up on the hook. If you are a sole trader or a partnership, um, the people that you borrow the money from will pursue you for that debt if you've got other assets. Um, so in the example of the cattle finance, the mart would let you pay it off over a period of time, but don't go into those agreements thinking, well, it'll be okay, you know, if cattle prices fall and I don't cover what I bought them for, it's not actually my money, it's the mart sort of money. You're the person who's borrowed the money from, from that lender. Um, and, you know, it doesn't happen a lot in farming because a lot of people in farming are very honest and, you know, banks, uh, Graham will tell you, you know, that, you know, banks suffer their least losses in the agricultural sort of industry. Uh, you're a pretty honest sort of bunch. Um, but if, if you're a sole trader at a partnership and you go into these loan agreements and you fall short on being able to cover the loan when you sell the asset or wherever, you will be pursued for other sort of assets that you've got. And um, when banks lend money, they kind of make sure, or any lender, they kind of make sure that there's a margin in there based on historic trading performance of that asset, that if it all goes wrong, the deposit is enough to cover any sort of shortfall. So, yeah. Yeah, you have to go in with your eyes open. Yes. It's not a very cheery way to, you know, <laughs> that should have been one of the first questions. Then we could have had good questions after that. But yeah, yeah. It, 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 if, it, if it goes wrong, the bank, you know, the lender will pursue you for the balance. Um, so we're just kind of going into our final kind of few moments. So if there's any questions, do you just get them in. Um, but you mentioned earlier just now that kind of interest rates are quite low. So what are the kind of typical interest rates on higher purchase and life at finance at the moment? Can I pass that to you again? I can tell you what the rates are for for, for long term funding and overdrafts, if that's helpful. But uh, I'm not an expert in asset finance, the HP, I'm afraid. Yeah, so depending on who you borrow the money from and what your deposit is, the interest rate will vary. So, you know, Graham, for example, will be lending at stuff, you know, round about 3%, but he'll have some customers on bank loans that he's probably down at 2%. And he'll have some people where he's got fairly unsecured lending that he might be at 5 7.5%. Um, your higher purchase, again, you know, because you've got, depending on the asset that you've got, if you've got a fairly good asset, such as a standard sort of tractor or combine, and you put down a good deposit against that, your rates will pretty much lie alongside the rates that you'll get on bank loans. So again, you might get some agreements where you get 2%. If you're putting down a very, very low deposit, you could be paying 7.5%. 
your livestock funding runs roughly the same so it'll be slightly more expensive than your higher purchase um, or your bank loans because livestock tend to die you know it's not like a, a combine that's going to be there in a year's time it could um, a live you know an animal could die so the rates tend to be sort of one to two percent more expensive um, different livestock marts for example on livestock uh, finance will have slightly different rates um, and they will have slightly different rates depending on who is borrowing the money so back to what I said earlier about having a relationship with someone the better the relationship you have with someone that you want to borrow money from the more chance you have at negotiating a better rate if they're offering you 7.5 percent you do have a very good relationship if they're offering you two three percent you've got a fairly good relationship with that person um, and try and put down as big a deposit as you can because that does determine the rate in a lot of instances and maybe just add nothing to do with HP or asset finance, but uh, with interest rates at historically low levels at the moment. Um, and if you're looking at funding something on a long term basis, it's probably worth looking at fixed rates at the moment because uh, they're, uh, I think, a 10 year fixed rates at 0.81% today with also the, the, the bank's margin on top of that. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's, um, you know, if, you, if you're looking to tuck something away and not lose sleep at night, then that's certainly something worth thinking about. Thank you. And I think our final question will be for you, Graham. So next week's webinar is on setting up a carbon neutral business. And banks are looking to start decarbonising their lending. So what impact will that have on higher purchase and livestock finance when farmers often get the finger pointed at them um, for all these greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so look, yeah, it, it, it's very much in vogue at the moment. And, and again, sorry, I can't, I'm not able to talk about the, the impact on asset finance and uh, HP or stocking finance, but certainly um, as far as bank funding, you know, some, some overdrafts and, and, and term lending for the longer term uh, side, you know, we're, we're looking very much at, uh, you know, how, how, do the, how do farmers make their businesses more sustainable? And, and that could be looking at, you know, the, the, the green option. It could be, you know, sort of, um, you know, making their, um, you know, their livestock housing, you know, more, more green. You know, it could be um, cutting down the, uh, the, the, the heat and electric that they, uh, they use in their, um, in their, uh, in, in their, in their milking parlours. So it's very much in vogue and, you know, there are, you know, there are there are certain institutions out there that will do specific um, uh, green loans, for example. I think that the the tricky piece that we've got at the moment, obviously, we've got the uh, the big uh, conference in Glasgow uh, later on this year about uh, um, climate change and the likes. But you know, I think you know, taking it a stage further, um, you know, what's the value is is the big question that I think banks are asking themselves just now. So, what is the value of of um of, of a carbon unit for example now there's the specialized firms that, that will look at that and will give you an opinion and give you a view on it but at the moment um, it's very difficult for banks to lend you know on a you know on, on a project that's uh, that, that's going to make them uh, more carbon friendly or indeed carbon neutral unless we can demonstrate that uh, it's either going to increase profitability or reduce costs so uh, I think watch this space. We're going to see much more of that. And I think you know, this year and into next, the markets will probably mature a, a lot better, and banks will, will will have to step up to the plate and look more closely at these things. Thank you. So thank you to both our speakers tonight, um, Graham and Jane. That's been very informative. Um, it's been quite interesting, and I hope everyone has learnt some valuable hints and tips about higher purchase and livestock finance and just general asset funding um, in agriculture. Our next um, webinar in the series, as I mentioned, is on setting up a carbon neutral business. Um, so that's next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, with Sam Parsons, the farm manager of Bacosti Estate. And Fife and Pete Ritchie, who is also on the farming for the 1.50 panel. Um, and there will be 
recordings of this webinar on the associated fact sheets going up on the FAS website very soon. But I'd just like to thank you all for turning up tonight and we hope to see you on another webinar very soon. Thank you.